Right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Kevin Barker, and uh, my good friend here, uh, Chris Herbert. Uh, we are here today as part of ROG uh, to deliver our talk on unlocking the secrets of the Proxmark RDB4. Uh, you, a lot of you already know uh, Chris quite well. Uh, uh, Chris Iceman uh, will be uh, taking us through uh, some of the various different attacks and bits and pieces later on. Uh, but before we do that, we'll give you a quick summary of uh, some of the other topics that we'll cover. Uh, first of all, there's about ROG, about us. Uh, what exactly is a Proxmark? Not a lot of people really sort of understand what this uh, hardware platform is and what it's capable of, uh, so we'll give you a quick walkthrough on that. Uh, the other is uh, a few uh, presentations and case studies where the Proxmark RDV4 uh, has been used out in the wild uh, to uh, harden security. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to uh, the previous generations, uh, various different limitations and uh, continual advancements that we've made uh, to the product over the years. Uh, and uh, yeah, using examples and Q&A. So, uh, I'm Christian Herman and you all guys knows me as Iceman. And I'm a RFID researcher, been on the Proxmark forum for six years, and I do software most of the time, and I'm a Microsoft Enterprise Architect certified guy, but that's just, you know, my old previous life. And, uh, well, you know, my popular fork about things. If you're into Proxmark, how many people in here know what a Proxmark is? Oh, we've got an educated crowd. And we've got some fancy people here as well. Did you know Adam Laura is here in the audience today? It's amazing. Give, her, give it a round of applause for Adam. <laughs> Woo! Makes us nervous to have such legends here. Okay, uh, I'm known by the handle uh, 0xFFFF. Uh, I have been the uh, NFC RFID researcher uh, for the Proxmark for quite a few years. Uh, uh, I like to do a lot of reverse engineering. Generally, I'm the person that uh, destroys the hardware. Uh, Chris is the, the builder of a great many things. Uh, what we have done is uh, a number of different smart card technologies as well. And uh, as many of you may know, uh, if you're a Proxmark owner, uh, I'm also the administrator of the Proxmark 3 uh, forum and uh, GitHub repo. Uh, I've been taking care of that for over a decade now, which has uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, all right, uh, moving forward, uh, we have the, uh, the Proxmark 3. Uh, now, uh, this is often referred to as the Swiss Army knife of RFID research. It is the go-to platform for uh, any sort of attack uh, based on NFC RFID, but it is now uh, also part of uh, 7816 uh, contact interfaces as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, We've got uh, a, a versatile tool with uh, a, a number of different plugins, a number of different add-ons uh, that people have uh, developed uh, and uh, uh, done pull requests uh, into the GitHub repo for uh, extended functionality and provided uh, uh, our, our iClass attacks and MyFair attacks, uh, Crypto one etc. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Previous work presented. Uh, yeah, well, uh, from the, uh, since the Proxmark has been around for 10 years at least, uh, there has been a number of talks about it previously, and, and they covered pretty much of some basic stuff about, about RFID and, and what's pe possible to do with it on Proxmark. So you have a Frank Brown uh, speak 2013 on Black Hat. Watch it. He didn't do very much on the MyFire stuff because he got stopped from his job working for NSA or something like that. You have Craig Young on uh, on DefCon 23. He made an excellent uh, speak about how to make more stuff into the Proxmark code and explain how the code works a bit because that's kind of messed up. And uh, yeah, we well, cloning in the field is uh, how to pen testers like to do. And um, yeah, we did a speak last autumn, oh, November, about things. Yeah. Go and watch them, it's kind of fun. We did some, um, last year was kind of exciting year if you're into RFID hacking, and uh, because there were some high profile um, practical applications from it, we can say. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, any of you have been aware of the uh, Tesla Model S uh, key, uh, key fob cloning uh, attack that uh, was carried out not so long ago, uh, but that was uh, using the Proxmark. Uh, 
Since then, the vehicle entry system had been upgraded to uh, mitigate these attacks. This is where uh, the Proxmark uh, 3 comes in real handy. Uh, in addition to that, we also had the uh, very popular uh, asset abloy uh, VIG card hack, uh, the hotel card hack, uh, which left uh, a lot of uh, hotel rooms uh, essentially unlocked uh, for quite a long period of time uh, before there was a, hardware, a later hardware generation uh, introduced to the market, uh, which is slowly being uh, introduced into uh, hotel chains around the world. Uh, it had quite a negative impact uh, on these chains because, uh, you know, having uh, a, a thousand hotel room doors uh, open all of a sudden is uh, is quite a bad thing to have happen. But that's why we've got this uh, IDV4 uh, platform uh, to be able to uh, find these risks and mitigate them as soon as possible. Uh, most of you people are not interested in mitigating things. You're most important, you know, to learn to break things. Anyway, previous generations. Yep. Uh, so starting from the beginning, uh, we had a very basic uh, Proxmark, uh, the original Proxmark board uh, that had a lack of interface options on it. Uh, it was quite bulky. Uh, connecting uh, external antennas, etc., uh, was quite complicated. Uh, required a uh, a reasonable understanding of NFC, RFID. Uh, along with uh, embedded development, uh, FPGA uh, experience, and so on. Uh, the end result was uh, a bulky product with even larger antennas, uh, poor quality control because uh, we had multiple people committing to the repository and uh, resulting in uh, a messy code, spaghetti code. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, we've also got uh, clunky weird leads and plugs that people couldn't acquire. Uh, and uh, there, there was unreliable hardware revisions that came out into the market, uh, and uh, there was nothing covert about it. It wasn't suitable for uh, red teamers, etc. Uh, so we decided that it's necessary to uh, make some changes uh, to the hardware platform. We certainly did. <laughs> Still yours. Okay. Uh, addressing these limitations, uh, well, we wanted it to look good. So uh, the original Proxmark was quite large. Uh, the new Proxmark is uh, quite literally uh, a quarter of the size of the original Proxmark. Yes, chipping in. We, when we're supposed to have a GoPro here, we'll show you the differences between yeah. those because we have them laying down there. But we're waiting for the camera to come in, and yeah. once that comes in, we'll show you again. Yeah. Uh, we've uh, introduced a flexible uh, RF interface uh, where custom antennas can be bolted on to the Proxmark. Uh, so custom designs uh, can allow for uh, embedded tokens, uh, uh, high, fit, um, uh, high shield uh, antennas, uh, embedded uh, capsules for anybody that's into biohacking, uh, and longer read range. Uh, our, our LF and HF range improvements are considerable uh, compared to the other options that are available on the market today. Uh, on top of that, we've also got two megabit uh, flash memory uh, for storing keys and co uh, carrying out dictionary attacks a 7816 contact interface for uh, SIM-based uh, credentials or contact IC uh, credentials. And it's covert. Uh, the unit's quite small. It can fit in your pocket, nobody would even know. Uh, I carry one on me all the time and it's the size of a credit card. You, 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 you can't, you can't uh, make it any smaller than that, really. Uh, and then we introduced an FPC uh, for active antennas, UARTs, Bluetooth, battery. Uh, the expansion options uh, we've uh, disclosed publicly uh, in the past, uh, so other developers can uh, introduce new features into the product. Uh, here we have the flexible RF interface, uh, the mechanical design uh, layout, and uh, the interface uh, description for the 125, 134 kilohertz antenna and the 1356 antenna. If you want to make your own. If you want to make your own. Sure. Uh, we also added a little bit more memory on the Proxmark because uh, it has a limited amount of memory as it was before, and we thought that we need to have some more way of store things, and you can't put on a more slots and SD memory cards. We managed to get a little bit of memory on. It's a flash memory, which is actually a little bit different than a normal RAM memory. Only. So we have limits with that, so it comes up to like uh, four, six, four kilobyte pages, which are divided into 16 sectors of 4K each. So you can actually just read or write four 
k pages at a time. So if you have previous there, you have to read it off a menu. I have to wipe it and then on again. It's kind of a little strange. But we added uh, a very good some commands for supporting for it. It's kind of easy to do it, and um, we will demonstrate that later on. Um, what you use it for is, of course, if you have a standalone mode. Standalone modes where you will want to have a battery option, and then you want to do things without a computer or laptop, standing in front of a um, reader or in a real test scenario for pen testers or red teamers or whatever, they will find it's not very covert standing there, it's like in front of a lock. Have you ever tried that? In, uh, you know, in a, in a gate, so it's like you see this little camera up there, and it's like, no, that's not very covert, is it? So if you do that with a Proxmark, you have a little battery add-on and you can use those things and you rewrite the code a bit. And you were kind of covert doing it. That's why we had this in mind when we thought about it. Uh, context analysis. So on the uh, Proxmark uh, RDB4, uh, we have an, an add-on module. Uh, we'd like to show you, but uh, we don't have the video up and running just yet, unfortunately. Uh, but it, it, it's a daughter board that sits on top of the Proxmark IDV4, uh, enabling us uh, to be able to attach uh, any sort of uh, uh, 7816 based uh, uh, contact uh, chip card. Yeah, one of the reasons for that was because nowadays this card has usually dual interfaces, the contactless and the contact, uh, like the, in the um, payment systems. So we thought we would like to do that in the same device. Kind of fun. Oh, that's how it looks like. Yeah, uh, APDUs can be sent uh, directly through uh, from the Proxmark 3 client uh, to the cards and responses can be uh, acquired. ATRs, etc., are all available now in uh, the current repo. It's kind of a small size package, so we didn't have very much place to put it. So it's hidden underneath the casing and we need to do a full size extender to it, which you see how it looks like. Uh, well, it enables the functionality, basically. And uh, the support in the firmware and the client for it is, is this new SC and EMV commands out there. This wasn't out in, uh, last November, but now we have it online so we can actually demonstrate it. But yeah, so that's why this slide is here. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, gives you, it shows the possibility to send raw APUs and things over the contact interface. Does anybody know what I speak about when I say raw APUs? Okay, a handful of people. Yeah, okay, well, that's one, okay. two of you guys, all right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, testing the limits. Oh, shit. Okay, yes, uh, we've, uh, we're, we're without a camera at the moment, uh, which has uh, limited our options considerably, uh, and also had an impact uh, on our presentation. <laughs> kind of. So, yeah. uh, what we might do is... Mm -hmm. oh. So we've got straight into it. Yeah. So we'll go back again. All right, all right, all right. All right. Um, you want me to do the demonstration anyway? All right. You want to see Iceman hack on cards? Yes. No, 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 you don't want that. <laughs> all right, a little bit fun. All right, let's see. Have you ever, you know, um, out of you guys who use the Proxmark and download the repo, do you use the right repo? <laughs> Remember that? Uh, for this Proxmark RDV4, you should use the RRG repo because that's where I added the most of the latest functionality supporting stuff. And once you download it and pull the latest, because even yesterday we pushed some fixes, kind of funny. And um, yeah, you need to compile that. And once you get all that setting up and, you know, and unblocking drivers and stuff like that, it's kind of easy to run. Um, sorry? Oh, the font larger. Font larger. How do you that then? See that work. <laughs> Is that big enough? Everybody can see that? In reels? Excellent. Let's see if I can do this. All right, I'm running it. Now it's clear. So you enter the Proxmo client, um, calling it up. You could actually run bash scripts directly, but that's how it is. So you see that, you know, once you start in, you start to, oh, can, I, can I do that? Yeah, I can do it. Look there. Okay. And okay. If you look at the first line there, it's important to notice what you have actually support for in the client and what we want to do is finding out what kind of support for hardware you have in, in the device. So we have these commands where you 
test your coins first is uh, HV version, which you just saw. Then we have HV status, which tells you a little bit more. It's hard to see this, I see. Oops. But it gives you about the onboard memories, what FPGA loaded image. This one is HF right now. The flash memory saying how much is up there. You see also that we have a smart card module added to it. And this is important for you guys to have it. Once you buy one of these, and if it says any added number than version 3.10 in the firmware there, you need to upgrade the firmware for that one, yeah, which is all thing. indicated in the wiki pages yeah. and stuff. Oh yeah, we've got a camera. We find that a lot of people will purchase the Proxmark for the first time and assume that they've got the latest firmware. Uh, it's definitely not always the case. Uh, the number one thing that you should be doing is going straight to the GitHub repo, go to the RRG repo, uh, 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 make a, a copy of the latest, and uh, compile and upgrade your Proxmark. Uh, the other is, just as Chris said, make sure that the, uh, uh, the version for the smart card module is at 3.1. All right. So, all right, now we've got a camera, and we're going to just demonstrate the chips a little, uh, the previous revisions, all right? Please work, please work, please work. <laughs> Hey! Give a All round right. of applause. We can move forward. It's good. <laughs> okay. So uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, the original Proxmark III. Uh, this uh, this particular project uh, was uh, developed by uh, Jonathan Vasteus. Thank you. Ten years ago. Yep. Jonathan Vasteus. Yeah, it's Netherlands. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it has. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's basically the main board that, uh, that kicked off uh, the Proxmark that we know today. Uh, it's got the uh, dreaded uh, high-rose connector. Uh, it's also got some uh, uh, bulky uh, JTAG connectors uh, and uh, very, very limited expansion options overall. But the product uh, was absolutely fantastic because that enabled uh, people to do the Crypto 1 attack uh, it was very famous back at the time, uh, and it's still very practical today. Uh, then after that, there was a number of different variants uh, that came out uh, as part of an improvement uh, on the original design. Uh, we've got the uh, RDME 2 uh, that, uh, that came out afterwards. Uh, not necessarily in order, but uh, yeah, there's uh, some other units uh, that we've got here uh, just to show uh, the improvements on the uh, RF connectors. Um, uh, and battery options. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Great. Uh, and then we've also got uh, the RDV3, which was uh, released not all that long ago. Uh, again, more attempts to try and uh, 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 condense the design, uh, try and uh, reduce the overall uh, footprint, uh, and make the uh, antennas uh, interchangeable, easily interchangeable. Uh, we didn't like any of that. So uh, we decided to make it uh, infinitesimally smaller, uh, and here's the RDV4. Now, compared to the original Proxmark, there's a considerable size difference between the two. We've put a lot of time and effort into this. Uh, and uh, all of the features that we mentioned earlier with the 2 megabit flash, the 7816 interface, uh, they're all features that are unique to the RDV4. And the same model? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. You will get off a hook in a little bit, but I'm almost about oh, <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's how it looks like. And yeah, with antennas, it looks like. Now you're on the hook again. <laughs> Is it? Is it there? No? We've got a switching delay. Switch? Yep. Switch? No? It should have just worked. Let's try again. That's mine. That's anticlimactic, isn't it? 
You're so like so excitement, yes. You're so patient, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. So if you see, it's a double antenna there. The large antenna is the HF antenna modified, and the dual antenna or the LF part is this here. It's a separate antenna that's screwed on top of this one. It's a very compact, nice solution compared to the wire frames that you see before ones. And the, oh, this is so sexy, this one, sorry to say that, and it's really smooth. Soft and silky as well. And now we're off again. All right, back to this one. So once you decide that you know what your firmware are and it looks great, and you can also, I'm going back here, and you can also see that your uh, communications with the device are working. You can also see which installed installation uh, standalone mode this is. You need to detect the antenna powers to make sure that you have a working device. You actually command HV tune. It takes a while because it does measure things. And there you go, you see, you get up the plot window. You can see the pike here is the, um, the focus on the 125 kilohertz uh, signal. That's also the visualization of it. You see this LF values, 45 volts, and the HF antenna is 50 volts. This has a very good value, so you know that you have a working, fully operational device. Now, what to do? We would need a card. Kevin. Do you have a card? I've only got one on me. Let's see. Not this one. How about we give that a shot? <laughs> hmm. Uh, where have I seen this card before? I'm not know. sure. No, no, no. I was just seeing it in my pocket. I'll put this one over here. So, it's there. And now, we go back again. And we wonder what kind of tag this is. You can try to do, there's two starting points, basically. One is the HF, high frequency search command, or you go for the, oops, or you go for the LF search commands, and, um, well, let's see, it's a hotel system, I'm pretty sure it's HF. Uh, actually, I do know that, but, you know, it's just for fun of it. Um, another thing you notice me, when I write things, I don't write out the commands completely, because uh, the Proxima command set is kind of scary in one way, and really easy to get confused about, but we try to add a lot of help text, so we usually have the H parameter to try to see if we get the help text out, and who explains the command in many ways. It's a very complex device and complex command sets. But if you run the HF search, it tries to detect, and voila, it found something. It found a MyFair Classic card. It also detects whether or not it's a magic Chinese uh, UID card, which is not. Mm, it looks like it's a genuine MyFair Classic card. And you see the PRN detection is something we added on, thanks to Philip and uh, other people, uh, to detect whether or not this card is susceptible to the dark side attack. Do you know about the dark side attack? Who knows about that? Adam, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. That's one way of getting the cryptology key for this kind of type of cards. But if you don't do that, I usually start somewhere else. I usually start with um, testing the default keys. Why? It's because usually cards comes with default keys. And for that, we have the MyFair. If you look for the MyFair commands, you can see it comes up there. It's something called the check. If you do that, the help text for it, you can see this. It was a 1K card, that's one. And I will use the default keys dictionary file for this, loading it up from the client, and execute it. It loads up 649 default keys is what I found in my little fork. Happily shared with everyone else. So far it found, yeah, it found all of the keys. Job done. Job. So, job done, yeah. This card's all cryptological keys found, easy and done. And now you want to do something. The problem is that you need to have a little dictionary file. We didn't save that once. So we tried to run it again to get the key file needed to dump this card. You see it's been saved. Next one to dump a file, our classic card is the HFMF dump command. Uh, I will do uh, H as well so you can see the help text. It's very simple on that one. So you can just basically run it after you got that key file out there. It just does this. Boom, 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 boom. Now we've copied all, the, all of the block data off the card. Yes. So now we've made a clone. No, not made a clone. We've made a copy of it. 
Yeah, uh, we did also some other change. When you do these things is that you get a binary file, and binary files is not easy to read, and we made this EML file format, which you can look at the hex text, uh, basically, from the dump file of the binaries. But that's also still not good enough, so we just recently added JSON format to explain more about the tag. So if you want to look at this card, it comes down since I started in the client folder, I need to go there, and the name is hfmf2dd. That would be this one. If you want to see this one, right up now. And, oh, it's up to small free as well. But you can see it's dumped by the Proxmark, and here's all the blocks. UDA, ATKQ, this is needed for if you want to make a genuine clone of this card later on. Here's all the keys, here's the access conditions, bytes, what was up. The user data 69 is a special little thing we have a extra trailer. And it goes on for the whole thing. So this is a very good format, and we did manage to get, if you have an Android phone and don't have a Proxmark, we made a uh, you know, um, possibility to read and export these files between the MCT, uh, MCT tool from um, uh, this Icarus guy from Germany. And uh, if you don't have it, do go and use it. We should also, sooner or later, when the people from LibUSB are getting on the track again, I'm not looking at you, Adam, and um, we get the support for the JSON file there as well. And uh, so, now you have a copy of a card that's happy and done. You can actually get the, just load up the MLL file and make the Proxmark now simulate this tag. So if I would have had a battery option, it could have just done that, and you can present it anyway and do it. This is basically you know, the, the functionality of doing something simple. This is not very fun, was it? It's just, oh my, this is the safety net, wow, and this is so simple. But it's not simple because it's easy to do and run the commands. It's easy because 10 years of knowledge has gone into making this Proxmox attack and Proxmox client so easy to use. It's not easy. If you would do from scratch, you would have a hard time cracking these babies, trust me. I don't even think I will be. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, with uh, with the amount of technology that's uh, gone into uh, the RDV4, uh, we're resting on the shoulders of giants. Uh, there's a lot of crypto analysts that have spent a lot of years researching uh, uh, the vulnerabilities within cards of these types, uh, such as the uh, PRNGs and uh, TRNGs. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we just need to get another microphone. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, I'm yeah, back here. Oh, yeah. There we go. Cool. Yeah, well, anyway, back to that one. Um, now, let's see. Tune, read, oh, default keys. Uh, let, let's do something. It comes down to speed in one of the times. It took some time to get drop these keys, and we, I wanted to show you we added the onboard memory support for the device, and you can actually upload the dictionary files onto the flash memory quite easily onto the Proxmog RDV4, and it's up there, and if you want to verify that you got it, we added in a little script, a Lua script, there's another of those magic little additions we have in, in Proxmark, you can run scripts, make your own, instead of compiling the source code in C, in C, if you don't like that, you can make Lua scripts. Here you see it downloads all of it and verifies it's found 649 passwords, which is on the device. Now you want to use that mother. So if you take me back with my hotel room key, that's actually my hotel room, so please don't copy it, like I did. And uh, if you go for the F check command again, you go for help, and you see this option here called use dictionary from flash memory. Oop, you see this one here. So if I add that to it, it will now run purely on the device. It doesn't use the client to verify the keys and find it. And I changed the algo about that one a little bit, so it cuts down the time. It takes about 5.6 seconds, or 5.9 seconds to find the keys, the default keys found in it. It's kind of fast, which is good. And from there I can of course dump, you know, save the files and keep on doing what I did. But this is the, the support and the, the strength of the onboard flash memory because you can get, you can do things, save, find the keys, you can save it, and you can do more things there. It's not implemented all of this into the source code. It's up for you guys to start adding to it, you know. I'm looking forward to that. So, next step, wing lock. Do you know about those? Nobody knows about wing lock. What are they? Head full of heads. Do the honors, please. Do the honors of wing lock. Let's speak about wing lock. <laughs> you got the camera?
Okay, here's a generic uh, big block card. Uh, this was uh, part of a, the famous hack uh, just recently, uh, opening up essentially all hotel rooms uh, using this technology type. Uh, what we have now is uh, the ability to uh, execute uh, that particular attack uh, straight on the RDB4. There. You know, if you want to detect this one, we know that we can run the info command. You see it's an uh, my file thread ev1 tag. And for that, we have a special command called hfmfu. It's very confusing, these little mf things, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, you get the hang of it. If I do that, you see what we have. You see you can do most of the that. You want to run the info command and see what you can read out of the tag right away. You get a little bit nervous when you read the last thing there. You should be. And if you go up here, you see that there's a my file delight. This version of the source code is my private, so it has an extra identification, so I know that this is a wing lock. And you would wonder why, for those who wonder so how that hack went out uh, last spring, was it? The wing lock, the F secure guys, 140 million hotel locks was in jeopardy. It's because one of the protections was this one time pad and the calculation of that one. It means I can verify there is. It doesn't use the onboard signature for it. When we dump this one, since it's usually used a default password for it. So you can dump this one pretty easily, just like that. However, you cannot write the one-time pad, we know that. But in my version of this, just to prove you something, there's a command called pvdn. And we, we're using the option R, it will use the tag ID. And yeah, you can actually calculate that yourself. And as you see, if you had a MIFA Classic, you would be able to do that as well. But yeah, that's just to prove it to you that uh, the wing lock things are very unsecure as they were. But yeah, it's fun, though. It's good fun. So back to the new functionalities. We got the smart card things, yes. Now, please. Don't look at this card. It's a Visa card. <laughs> it's an expired Visa card? It, it is an expired Visa card. So it doesn't exist anymore? <laughs> so, no, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me see with this. This is one of those dual interface things. So, we can do two things. You have a chip. Or, yeah, let's do that. You can either use a chip, <laughs> or uh, we can use the, the contactless things. I will just demonstrate that we just plug in the extender to this one there, and to see that it's in. I'm back here. Let's see. The smart card function is called S. Ooh, how do we go? All right, cool. So the info about this one, you see, this is you get the ATR and it uh, calculates and shows what well, that's it. Doesn't say very much, but you have the ability to send raw HPDUs to it and talk to it and, and see the trace list of uh, what happens with this communication with its card. However, just recently, like in December, uh, Murloc, uh, another user from the forum, um, has been working very hard with the, the new commands that we call the EMV cards. It's for uh, this set with these master cards and all that. And you can use those to. This is another thing is here you have to do dash H to get use both the contact uh, interface and you have, can also use the contact less interface. So we will select this one. We will do the wired because we hooked up to that and we want to see the TVL decoded results from this one. So the channel contact reads it out. And boom, we're reading stuff out of this one. I hope I'm not showing too much now. Hope I didn't do that. No, it's not too bad. Uh, I don't, that's not too bad, is it? Yeah, it's just the PVT. Yeah, yeah, great. But then we have the TLB. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> now I take it out again and put it on the reader. So now we're using the, um, the, the contactless format, the RFID part of it, which would be the same command but without the W. And you can read out the, from that and face the same values. So this is the strength what we wanted to see in the RV4, the ability to look at the dual interface cards at the same time. Um, it's like the thing I got here. So now this is a 4K MyFair Classic card, and it, does, it has a chip on it, and that's actually a mag stripe on it. So I was like very confused, why do you have this as an entry system? But we did. Uh, yeah, oops, maybe I shouldn't do that either. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, it, so it, it, if you, this... 
Part of before makes you possible to do more things. Look at this. You want to analyze things. You want to look at data. You want to get data out of it and how it responds and what times it does that. So this is what we want to do with those. And we added those support for that, support for that because we felt it's, it lacked that. And we did also add the Roca test. Do you know what the Roca vulnerability, the return of a Coppersmith attack? Do you know what that was? Okay. Turn out one of those uh, smart card chips. Do you know about those? I don't know about it. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, it's implemented. Uh, anyway, um, the, the Estonian e identification card for the country had uh, some research to look at the smart card, uh, the, the signatures of this certificate on, the, on this, the cryptocurrency certificate on this card, not this one. Uh, and they found out that the randomness in those generated RSA keys was bad, and they call it the return of a coppersmith attack. Or the coppersmith attack, and then someone did an improvement of it, and they made an online test for it. And we actually implemented that one into the Proxmox free client, so you can actually see if it is, you know, if this, this, the cert is, has this vulnerability. There is no um, practical attack on it yet. I tried to look into it, but that's too much RSA for me for, to be happy. But we added that. We also had this mode we call the brute force uh, mode for this one. It means that on this um, uh, 7618 cards, you have this uh, application IDs that you don't you always know where, where they are. But this one will brute force it. It's actually happily stolen from Adam Loris R3 Idiots repository. I don't know why I got that inspiration. But anyway, it's from him. Anyway, thank you so much. So we did that stuff. That's very funny. So you can get out very much more from your Visa cards when you do this and hook it up. And uh, yeah, don't be afraid. But you know, when you see something track two or something like that showing up in your output, you should be a little bit afraid. And ooh, UID cards. Should we talk about that? No. Nah. Okay, let's go to something funnier then. Okay, one more card. You want to have one more card, or do you think it's boring? You're so silent. You're so polite. You want one more card or not? Yes. Why do you want it, your little ones? Huh? Yeah, you know, you just want to see me do bad stuff. Anyway, there's another one of those travel cards. This is a travel card from a country where I'm from, and, you know, running the normal stuff. It says it's a one click card, but here you see something that's very interesting. It says the PNT detection is the hard. This one is the new, improved version of MyFair Classic. This is this retaliation for those dark side attacks. And it was invulnerable for a long time until the original guy who did the original tech, Rel, released 2015, released a new research paper called um, uh, Faulty Imperity, bloody, 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 bloody. And um, from that paper, he described a parity attack for our finalists and then coughing into the Crypto One Crypto. And that triggered some people on the forum, some excellent C programmers who'd done some of the enhanced attacks before, PV, and another user who hasn't been online for, for a long time called Blapo. So you don't, yeah, it's, we know where they are, but oh, we know about them. And uh, they made some solvers for this hard nested attack, and it was amazing. But it had to. It had some downside. It took time. It took about forty to 50,000 answers and it took time to run it. Uh, it's hard. It's, it's very hard to run that attack. Then PV took one and a half years on him to, to make an improved version of this. Meanwhile, another third user, Enter Player Free, Azid comes up and comes up with a bit slice solver for this, uh, for Crypto One attacks and just punish the, the time it takes to brute force something. The thing with hard nested attacks, which is implemented in the MF, in the prox, oops, Proxmo client, it is that you can only attack one sector at a time, um, because and you need to have a known key since before. And now this is strange, and this one where we come back to the F check. Remember, I, oops, <laughs> you remember why I always say I always go back to F check. It's because you need a you know you need a default key to be able to run against it. This time I know because this is all known keys, so we pretend we didn't see all of the keys, but it does have all the keys already found. Us. So yeah, here we go. Just pretend that we didn't find these ones, okay? So I can show you this one off. MF hard. 
sector A. And I want to target one. Let's see, I want to have sector 60 A. Hey, should be 54 then. You run it up, and it's optimized for different cores of your uh, CPU, so it's even better on uh, high powered CPUs. And um, yeah. It's time as you oh, yeah, yeah. If you see this, it's the. Uh, oh, yep. Oh, okay. Sorry. I have to do that. <laughs> In the corner here, you see the amount of nouns as it collects and tries to do uh, for the attack. And here's the different uh, bit flipping apparatus on it, and it still runs now. And an estimate how long time it will take to, to crack this key. And it keeps on running. Come on. Give it to us. Yeah, there you go. You got the key down there. I will show you like this. It will be easy. So I found the key straight off. You can compare it. It takes about normally about the 20 to 30 seconds, but some of these keys have um, better parity fixing for it, and it takes longer time. But you only need the 1600 nouns to collect. It means it's a very fast command to run in that sense, compared to the previous attacks. The improvements of these attacks is like magnificent scales of them. Like amazing. So with this stuff, you can run mm, list. Yeah, you will see this. You see something else. Oops. Run, run. Hard. Auto pawn. Yeah, I know. Kinky names. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, pawn. Auto pawn. Here you go. You need to, you know, if you want to do things like this, you would like to run. Uh, do you want me to run this or do you want to continue? Okay, yeah, that's even. I do it. Just for the sake of it. And if you run this one, you want to, you know, this is what I call the improved hardness uh, script, outbound script, which is if you run something called My Lazy, My Lazy Cracker, remember that one? Who knows about that one? No, okay. There's one or two dots. <laughs> that's <amazing. laughs> that's okay. Anyway, when you run this, it tries to you know, run this hardness to attack against all sectors that needs to be found. It also tries to improve it by doing some fast checks of keys so it doesn't have to repeat and find exactly every block of it. And when it runs, this will take about three minutes to run, so it's not that fun to see. But it will actually just do that and it will ask you, do you want me to save the keys? Yes or no? And if you found all the keys, it will only ask you, it will ask you about um, if you want to dump the card. And you just say yes, boom, you get it dumped, and it also will convert, you get this by binary file, AML file, VASM file, and then it actually transforms it into HTML file. So you all set. Yeah. Yeah, you can like, look at it nicely and everything like that. It's kind of fun. There have been a lot of optimizations in that area. Yeah. Leading everything up, making it a lot more user-friendly than what it has been in the past. As, as back to the thing, it, it looks simple, but yeah, it's because it took hours to make it simple. <laughs> I like this stuff. It can run there. If you wanna... Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But based on on these attacks, uh, we we need to make a lot of assumptions, and we need to hope that a lot of things have been set up in place uh, uh, to be able to carry out these attacks successfully. Uh, Making use of a particular car technology type, such as uh, this one here, uh, it's a lot better to fill up every single sector, every single block with random keys, rather than just leaving any default key on the card. That makes an attack a lot harder to carry out. Uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of distributors don't necessarily do that, uh, so it leaves it, leaves it open for uh, a hard nested, uh, like the one that we just carried out. Meanwhile, this attack is running out, and we'll come back when it's finished. <laughs> Takes a while. Well, you should be on that one. There you go. All right. Oh, yeah, Proxmark, Q&A. Do you have any questions? Come on. How does it need the RDB4 uh, is to proper match breaking? Do that again. Yes. Sorry, we're just Hold getting on, back from this. One more microphone for you. Hello, hi, this is Rish, and uh, I have a Proxmark 3, RDV 3, 
and it is a very resilient device uh, multiple times i have you know first up uh, firmware and it and have been able to revive that properly so i just wanted to understand that are there any mitigations built for or are there any checks and how resilient is the rdb4 uh, with respect to improper flashing or breaking and if we can revive it properly do we have anything on that part um j tagging <laughs> is the key to breaking. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Uh, often, often the problem is that uh, people will download uh, from the wrong repo or, or don't necessarily understand that uh, you know, they've purchased a Proxmark from one location and gone to another uh, to, to get their binaries, and that's where things sort of get a little bit messed up. Uh, the the only real solution for for a brick prox mark is uh, to go for JTAG, uh, but we've solved most of those issues. Uh, we've refined the uh, the processes for that. Uh, the firmware flasher uh, is a lot more stable than what it ever has been before, uh, and with the RDB4, uh, we're having trouble actually getting it to tip over. To be honest, so. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Oh, any uh, other question from here? Uh, hi. Uh, so for the high frequency car, you have like you try to find out key A and key B, right? If it's not FFFF, for uh, reading about the cards. Like when you're reading into high frequency MIFI cards, uh, you you have to figure out the keys before you clone it, right? Yes, you have to have all the cryptographical keys to be able to read out the card, and then it comes down to the idea of what does the valid reader system, the RFID system, would use as this card if they are checking things. Sometimes they only check the UID, sometimes they read it off the A key, or sometimes they need the card to be exactly the same. So yeah, that's a give and take, you know, but normally you will use uh, the UID changeable cards in order to, to get something out of it. Speaking of which, would you mind to give okay. this to the fellow? So the keys, uh, like when you're in the process of finding it, uh, if, if, if the card is not using default keys, do you brute force us or, you, or I came across some algorithms like MFC UK and MFC oh, CK? okay, yeah, yeah, the, 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 uh, Lib NFC, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm, MF, MFOC and MFUC, yeah. Th that's actually what's called dark side attack in the Proxmark world. Okay. And the nested attack is the MEMFOC, I think it is. So it's the same attacks implemented. For the, the, the dark side attack, it just attacks a weak card, so you only need, it's a card only attack. For the hard nested, which is not properly implemented in LibNFC right now, there's some <laughs> PRs for it, you would need a known key. And you can only get that two ways right now. You can sniff the traffic with a Proxmark or with, a, I think you can, can you? with LibNFC, yeah. And you get the key, then the announcers need for that one, or you have a default key. Okay, oh, thank wait, you. Wait, 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 just give me two seconds. I'm just gonna go back here. Sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, the script is finished. So we're asking if you want to save the keys. Yeah, sure. And you want to select the store name. If you just press enter, it takes the default name. You want to dump the card? Yeah, sure, do that. How about that? Yeah, now it's just that. So yeah, keep on with question. Yeah, that was it. Like, I was just curious about it. I was trying to implement those things. We're uh, using an Arduino and uh, RC522. I've done it like a couple of years back. And where I got stuck was I had default keys, and I could, I could using magic cards, I could, re, I could read and write into uh, UIDs. But then the other blocks, I was struggling with it because other than default keys, I didn't have it, and I was yeah. trying to implement it. And then it's so just sniffing, the sniffing the traffic is how you, you know, go forward if you want to, you know, find more keys. And yeah, so some of the uh, NXP family, uh, like the uh, five two two or the six six three three six six three, uh, have what they refer to as a raw mode. Uh, There's uh, similar for TI as well, uh, TRFs, uh, and they allow that as well. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. We can take the questions offline. Please go and have a short break. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that one. Thank you.